Welcome to the Spa Girls podcast. Each week we bring you the very best of self-publishing tips, tools and resources for authors. I'm Shah Barrett. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Wendy Vella. And I'm Trudy J. Welcome to the spa, everyone. Hi. Welcome. This week we have an awesome guest. I'm super excited to talk to her. It's Vanessa Vale. Hey, Hello, Vanessa. Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa. <laughs> Vanessa is the one in charge of the awesome Facebook group Thrifty Tips for Authors, um, which, I mean, who doesn't want Thrifty Tips yeah. for a start, exactly. like starting right mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to read your bio, Vanessa, and then we're going to get mm-hmm. right into it because you've also got a course coming out, which sounds awesome, and I'm sure we're going to get loads and loads of tips from you. So, yay. Yay. Um, <laughs> they all need them. So, but first, the bio. Uh, USA Today bestseller. Oh, Vanessa. Oh, sorry. I'm going to start again with that. A USA Today bestseller with more than 80 books and translated into multiple languages, Vanessa Vale writes tempting romance with unapologetic bad boys who don't just fall in love, they fall hard. Her books have sold sold over 1 million copies. She lives in the American West where she's always finding inspiration for her next story. While she's not as skilled at social media as her kids, she loves to interact with readers. It's lovely. Nice. I'm sorry that Welcome. I keep getting over it. But... Welcome, Vanessa. <laughs> you did great. Thank you. <laughs> so, Vanessa, let's start at the beginning. Um, I, well, first of all, I have to say I love the sound of your heroes, and we're going to talk about that in, um, later because okay. I have questions because that's that sounds awesome. That's immediately, as a reader, triggered me like, oh, my God, these, these heroes sound awesome, like yeah, just, just do. without even doing anything. So I can see why you are so good at marketing because you're just getting mm. it in – um intrinsic or Just right in one the, liner in bio yeah. right yeah. yeah yeah so that was awesome so, truth. yeah go you um but let's start let's start at the beginning and can you tell us a little bit about how you got into um writing and self-publishing let's start there well um I started writing on a dare from um a work colleague and um we I mentioned I think in passing that I like to read romance and then he suggested it can't be that hard and I said yeah how hard can it be to write romance and then we both decided that we should write a romance to see how hard it would be and I don't usually do anything um half-heartedly and so I actually (laughs) joined the local um romance writers group uh at that time and Amazingly enough, my first, very first meeting, which was over 20 years ago, um, had Julia Quinn. Oh, as wow. The speaker. Oh, I, mean, the I know. Song. So, and she talked about dialogue. I remember this vividly. And obviously, you guys all know, and everyone probably in the world now knows that her dialogue is so amazing. So, um, I had a great class to start with. And then wow. I was put into a great critique group of ladies from um, that. Um, a meeting and then we just went from there this was a long long time ago so it was back before um amazon or any kind of um self-publishing and then um it took years and years and then finally um i put some books up so back in 2015 vanessa vale um, was born and there we go Wow, it sounds like a superhero name, doesn't it? Yeah, sounds like Vanessa Vale. Vanessa Vale's sister. <laughs> did the person you have the bet with do the book as well? Did he? Did yes. he write his book? You know. I don't know. That's a good question. I, I would say no. No. Yeah. <laughs> I think he figured out how hard it really yeah. was to yeah, write yeah. one, yeah. and just then just gave up because yeah. it yeah. certainly isn't easy. And I and I learned that too the hard way. Yeah. 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 That's all right. I mean, I'm Betty regrets not doing it now that he can see you with your 80 books and your yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will say my first book, and I've shared with it, shared this story, is that my first book had the heroine kidnapped three times. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So, that happens. I mean, that happens. <laughs> I mean really so unluckily. Clearly I um had that trope down maybe one too many times. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant do you still have that book up can we go buy oh book? no oh no <laughs> <laughs> oh, i should put it up i should offer it to everybody as a see what happens see where you can go yeah. from yeah, yeah this is yeah that's that perfect oh that's awesome Before okay and, <laughs> and so so you've been self-publishing since two oh vanessa vale has been self-publishing oh. since 2015 so um are, are all your 80 books under that one pen name or you've got other pen, secret pen names? Okay, so Vanessa Vale. They are. They're all under that name. And they're, I've, they have been, up until recently, pretty much predominantly cowboys, either historical okay. or contemporary. Yeah. So, um, um, but mostly small town. And lately I've sort of literally just 
taken the hat off of my heroes and cowboy hat off. And so now it's pretty much small town okay. without the cowboy hat. Ah, interesting. Okay. And is that, do you find that a big difference between the cowboys and the non-cowboys? Is it a... I think from a reader's perspective, there are some readers who don't want to read a cowboy story. However, they're willing to read a small town romance set in the West with a hero who lives on a ranch that doesn't wear a cowboy hat. <laughs> yeah, I agree. There's a <laughs> distinction, clearly. <laughs> there is a very clear distinction. And I think that taking off the cowboy hat makes my stories pretty much identical, except um, it shifts um, my reader base slightly or, or it enlarges it. Yeah. And you've How noticed, you've noticed that, that it has, has grown? Yes. Wow. wow. And, and did you have have... taken a head off? Yeah. Uh, did you have any pushback? Did you have any readers come to you and say, hang on? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no oh, yeah. because um, it was just a slight shift. I didn't mm. move to say like New York City or something, I, I've mm. stuck with, it's kind of like that salsa commercial where they talk about New York City, you know, I, um, you guys are all from New Zealand and that's what's funny. <laughs> it's <about> okay. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I, I just literally took off the hat. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's brilliant. Hilarious. Yeah. And do you, like, so you're in your bio, you say unapologetic bad boys who don't just fall in love, they fall hard, which as I said, I'm immediately going, oh Very my God, line. they sound awesome. Yeah. Is that literally every book that you don't have any betas, heroes, or, you know, that they're, they're these strong alpha guys who fall hard with that? That's a good question. In comparison to a lot of alpha heroes out there, I think there's now a new scale. Mm. Um, and so, um, Mine are very alpha. They're not overly dominant in in comparison to others these days. Yeah. Um, I I am personally as a reader, I love insta love stories. Um, but I think as a reader, I also want to jump into romance where I know that the hero wants the heroine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we, I think um, as women, that would be really great if it was you know you go out and meet a man and you instantly know that he is like into you and. You know, yeah. all the things that you were looking for instead of playing any games or whatever. So when mm -hmm. we're reading fantasy, I'm not talking about fantasy books, but the fantasy of reading fiction, mm -hmm. that um, yeah. that I, that's what we, I think, crave in a story. At least I do. Yeah, yeah. So yeah I agree. I'm, yeah. Right. So I want a guy to sweep me off my feet, to be a little bossy, but yeah. also let me be my own woman. And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, all the things that I want in a fictional romance yeah. hero yeah yeah well, I think that's yeah. awesome that's so I true. do all of it I do and there's is a distinct difference like you think about um that idea of the hero falling in love straight away like him being the one that he knows straight away versus where they're like oh I'm not sure and there's like you know all the roadblocks and they're not they don't know there's a I definitely think mm. there's a preference for that like right that, and that there's actually just knows. like a hashtag and, um and a trope called he falls first yeah. and, ah. and, and so I have it's not like it's a new thing, but I think hashtag wise, it's kind of new yeah. where it's more than insta love. It's different because it he falls first in that mm. he sees her, wants her, loves her. I think insta love stories come across as almost obsessive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and that's great mm -hmm. because those are stories are fun too to read. I can think of mm. lots of authors who write those and you just, you're like, give me, but um, he falls first, I think has a bigger story arc in that. Mm. Um, he falls for her, but there's a lot of conflicts and challenges to yeah. work through as uh, a person and as a couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like no, that's that. cool. I like that. Mm. Um, and so you started the Thrifty Tips um, Facebook group. Can you tell us a story of why, how that came about, like where it came from, why you started it? The uh, the Thrifty Tips group started in uh, in January of two years ago, so 2021. So we're at the beginning of the year. So it's been a little over two years now. And um, I was sharing tips with close author friends about how I do my um, author brand strategy um, because I don't spend any uh, income on ads um, or promotions. Um, back in the day, my Facebook ad account was shut down and um, they wouldn't give it back. And so I was forced to find ways to um, promote my books outside of paid ads. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was Amazon ads and I tried them. I dabbled in them, but I never really saw any results because I'm a wide author. 
And um, to because wide books are weighted differently than Kindle Unlimited books on Amazon, the visibility is different. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is a struggle using Amazon ads to even get the visibility um, with those. And I just personally um, am spend thrift. I'm a spend thrift. I'm not sure what the right word would be. Thrifty. <laughs> I just don't like to spend money where I don't have tangible um, um, gain with yeah. them. And mm -hmm. Amazon ads, I just didn't find it. And I just didn't continue with them at all. Um, so I was limited to what I could come up with through grassroots ways, such as emails, um, word of mouth, sharing with other authors and so on. And so these tips, um, I found my, my friends found beneficial. And so I started the group. I thought maybe like 30 of my friends would join and I would share a tip here or there. Um, and that wasn't the case. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I think you've got That's something awesome. like 2,500 in the group now. Is that right? Something like that. Yes. Wow. I'm impressed you've got 2,500 author friends. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm so popular. If anyone knows me, then, then they would be laughing at that statement because I am the, I, if there's a picture of an introvert in the dictionary, my photo is next to it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Most writers are like that, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of writers. Um, so that's cool. So you've been doing that for three years and then you've um, set up the course as well. Is that coming out soon? So we, we can talk quickly about that. Right. The course is brand new. I have been working on it for a few months, taking um, the information that I've shared in the class, but also the at pretty much everything that I do. And I sort of merged it and formed it into a class to share with others. Um, everything in it um, does not cost money, low or no cost things. So when you go through the class, you'll see by the time you get to the end that there was nothing in there that cost money. Um, or yes, there's not, no, no, um, nothing in there that I expect anyone to spend money on. There can uh, be add-ons such as Facebook ads or other things like that, that you want to add on, but the things I'm teaching don't include, don't require it. Yeah. Um, so there are some, a few nominal things that you need to have, regardless of whether you use my tips or not, such as a website mm -hmm. um, and things like that, that you have to pay for regardless. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, I'm not suggesting in my class anything that costs yeah. money yeah yeah so if we could get um if we talk about some of the things that you um have done or are doing that are um uh the the kind of free or not free stuff um where did you start like did you kind of go I oh, know I'm gonna work on my newsletter or was it more broad than that like how did you go from no Facebook ads to where you are yeah. now right Right. It's a good question. There's a, there's a, a little bit of everything. So if you think of in, in the class, I talk about it as like a house mm -hmm. and, and I use the analogy of the three little pigs, the story of the three little pigs, you know, with the straw house and then mm -hmm. the wood house and the brick house. Well, I simplify the story down to just straw house and the brick house. And that if um, you're an author and you um, rely on um, marketing and promotional things that do not belong to you, if they're taken away or, you know, or there is some crazy um, storm in the author land, um, will your house get blown down? And if it does, will you be left with anything? Um, if you have a house of brick of solid um, marketing and strategies and bricks and you build all of those up, then um, you have a house of brick. And then if there's a crazy whim, so for example, um, Facebook shuts down. TikTok shuts down or something like that, or you lose your ad account or you know something we can't even imagine yet. If that occurs, can you withstand that shift mm -hmm. in author mm -hmm. land or mm -hmm. reader land that you can um, continue on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like that f stable foundation of your like. So mm -hmm. the wind can come, maybe knock a couple of bricks off, but it's still, mm -hmm. you can still live in the house. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Because your Facebook ads or any other ads that you pay for um, don't belong to you. They're mm -hmm. not yours. You're just giving them money to put up these ads in the hopes that they will bring in readers and you'll make money off of them. However, they don't have any guarantee that it's going to happen. And so you're putting out money there that um, you can't guarantee the returns. Mm -hmm. And also um, you can't guarantee that they won't take the whole system away 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm not knocking Facebook ads. I'm just, I just use it as an example because it works amazingly well for so many people. Mm -hmm. It's a great tool. So I'm sharing that very clearly. It's an exceptional tool. However, it's not the only tool. And if it was taken away, I think um, many, many authors can say that, oh yeah, they shut my account down for a day or a week or three months, or I've never gotten it back. Then if that happens, then the, that tool is gone. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have anything else besides that in its place that belongs to you, then um, you could take a ding um, in your marketing or in your author career in general, or in your finances, that could be um, a struggle. Yeah. 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 So if, if I'm an author and maybe I'm even a newish author and I I'm, think that's an amazing um, concept that you're talking about, where do I start? If I'm, if I'm like, I have, I have to create this amazing solid brick house foundation. What do I right. do? Well, okay. So make sure you circle back to answer this question because it goes in multiple prongs in multiple directions. So like you said, there's lots of bricks. Mm -hmm. So one of them of course is to write more books. Yeah. So if you think about your your first, if you write a book, one book, right? Technically, and sadly, I'm sorry, this is the sad moment of your podcast. <laughs> that one book is a dead end for readers. Mm -hmm. yeah. so think of it as like a train track and you're going on the train track and then you hit the end where it has that little sign that says end of the line and it just has a big stop thing. Well, you're going on your track and then you have one book and your readers gobbled up like, oh, I love this. I love her. This book is amazing. Well, they can't continue down the track of your books because why you only have one. And yeah. as we all know that readers are ridiculously fickle and they're like, oh, she wrote an amazing small town romance book with alpha heroes. I loved it, but she has no more. Fine. I'm going to go find someone else who does that. Yeah, and yeah. I'm not saying that I'm competing with someone else who's writing those books, yeah. but they're going to go to somebody else until I deliver <clears> another book. <throat> yeah. So it's important to keep on writing. The more mm -hmm. books you have, the better, um, the more readers will gobble up your books, the more money you will make, the more backlist you have. And that's a different and a huge brick in my class about how to um, earn large amount of income from your backlist. So mm -hmm. one, I would say, keep writing. Second, mm -hmm. I would say, yes, things like a newsletter and other tools that belong to you, um, keep growing them. So using, so to grow your newsletter list, now remember, I'm sorry, I have an itch in my back. So those who are it's watching, a scratch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your newsletter list is the, the is one thing you own. People will sign mm -hmm. up intentionally and purposefully for you. And mm -hmm. so whether you, um, if the, whether they read your book and they loved it and they want to have an email from you to know more, or you give them a reader magnet or some other lure to draw them in, they are choosing you. So they voluntarily signed up for your list and are there and they are your readers. They are mm -hmm. the ones that, purposefully picked you. So keep them. And so the more that grows, that means you have more people who purposefully signed up for you, mm -hmm. um, whether it's organic or inorganic. So growing that list is really crucial. So using free tools to grow your newsletter list are really important. They range from anything from the obvious newsletter swap, which everyone rolls their eyes at these days, but it is a great tool to um, round robins, um, author book clubs, um, even posting and sharing on social media. The mm. list goes on and on of ways to grow that list. So the more you have that list grown, the better. Uh, and then within of that, some of those suggestions included working with other authors. And so networking with other authors is, in my opinion, the best way to grow your visibility, grow your friendships and bond with other authors, and grow your networking abilities to uh, be included in other things. So maybe mm -hmm. I'm not doing a round robin, but I just met the four of you. And now, of course, you're going to think of me when mm -hmm. you have some kind of small town alpha male mm -hmm. uh, group promo and I can be a part of it. And so mm -hmm. that kind of networking is a great way mm -hmm. to um, grow. So these little mm -hmm. bricks I just mentioned are all free. But when they start to build together, you start to go and grow a community, mm -hmm. you grow readership that belongs to you and um, you grow a backlist that you can use and work with. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's quite, how do you reach out to other authors? I mean, how do you find those authors that are sort of at your level or do you go for the little step up and go and, and reach out to them? I mean, as a, that's probably my thing I hate most of all to do. Um, it is a tough one. It, as all of these girls will go, yes, she does. But it's like, I'm never sure who to reach out to. 
what what's your right. suggestions there? So your your question is in reference to networking. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I make sure because yeah, I want no, to no, sure. sorry, I should have clarified. So, yeah. Um, one thing to consider is being a reader yourself. So mm -hmm. I read, for example, I read Mary's book and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I am now a fan of Mary. So I write to Mary and say, <laughs> I just wanted to let you know, I really enjoyed your book. Uh, okay. Because it's, a, it's completely true. You are mm -hmm. a reader fan. You enjoyed the book. I yeah. sat on a plane, um, and next to me, a woman was reading another cowboy author that I knew of. I never met her, but I was like, oh, I wanted to like, you know, I wanted to say something, but I was like, no, don't read her book. Read my book next. <laughs> <laughs> um, she, she was reading an author that I knew of. And I sent her a note in Facebook. I went to Messenger or you could go to their email and just find their email on their website or something. But I just said, I just wanted you to know. I said, I know you don't really even know me, but I wanted you to know I was on a plane last night and I sat next to a woman who was reading your book. Brilliant. Complete truth. And it yeah. was. And if someone, if someone sent that to me and told me someone was reading my book next to my yeah. airplane, yeah. I would be so excited. Yeah. I mean, just be wonderful. Um, also, um, another thing is, is that if you know someone who's in a group with you as an author group, but you're not really close with them and you see that they've got a new release coming out, or you see come up on Facebook, share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My friend yeah. Mary's got a new release. Here's all the information. She posted it. So you could reshare or share now or whatever the button is on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Share it. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not, mm -hmm. you're not brown nosing, but technically no. you are, but there's nothing yeah. wrong with it. one click takes all of maybe 20 seconds to share yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That reader, that so that author will appreciate it and remember you. And you've done absolutely nothing um, with expectation in return. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but those little things all over the place, you grow um, subtle. I don't, you become the nice author. There's nothing wrong. And you don't have to be an extrovert to do that because you just yeah. push the button. Yeah. And then maybe in Facebook groups where it's an author forward Facebook group. So it's author industry group, not really for readers as much. Um, comment mm. on someone's post. or They're asking about um, a newsletter to say, oh, yes, I did this and has and just, you know, offering something relevant so that you become familiar, your name becomes familiar. Yeah. Put yourself out there, but I. Right. And it's not yeah. really in an extroverted way. You're just commenting yeah. on things so that you become present in, in their lives. Yeah. Mm. Makes yeah, sense. That's awesome. yeah. I like that idea. Of, yeah. I like the idea of kind of building up your reputation over time. Mm. Like I think sometimes because we want everything fast and now mm. we kind of mm. want to go we it's sort of like people want you to just say oh there's this one trick that you'll mm. be able to do and right and everything will change. With everyone. yeah yeah right actually, i know look, i am also in next to the dictionary is me under impatience because i have none whatsoever <laughs> and i have two grown boys so you would think i would have it by now but i i don't i have no patience but i will say that writing is is a marathon and not a sprint mm. um and if you're a wide author, especially you, it's, it's definitely more of a marathon because you're reaching um, different audiences in different ways. And it is a slower grow. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, I, I find that I am not a new release author. I'm a backlist author. Mm -hmm. And I talk about that concept in my class because it's really important that um, I'm not trying to find value in my new release as much as growing my backlist. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, can we it's talk about that? Mm. Yeah. Can we talk then about that quickly? Because I, I jumped over the whole writing stuff and mm. went straight to the marketing, but I actually do want to quickly. So you've got you've got 80 books out. Um, and that's happened presumably since um 2015 to now. Yes. Like how many books are you writing a year? How many do you put out a year? How and how many series do you have? Like, is it all right? Right. You so you you said there was no math involved. Now, <laughs> now you put her on the okay, spot. Okay, so over eight years of eighty books, I'll say I averaged about ten books a year. So okay, I was starting wow. off at maybe more than that, and then I know, I think two years ago I did nine. Last year I think I did nine or eight, and I think this year I'm planning on seven. How um, many words are they? Are they big books or they they are. They were they were consistently thirty five thousand to forty thousand words. Okay. Yeah, um, I um, talk about from an author perspective the value of word count 
mm -hmm. um, and how much you can earn for your word counts and making sure you find the sweet spot on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. However, lately I've been writing longer books um, because I'm trying to tap into the um, longer reader market. Mm -hmm. I mean, re the reader, in the sense that the readers don't want to, I, I don't want to hit the short story market. I want to hit people who are looking for a little bit longer book, not the really great long ones, but to the middle of the road. Yeah. Okay. Um, so to answer your question, um, I average about eight or nine books a year. And then my series, I think, oh gosh, that's the tricky one. I have to switch screens on my computer, but I'm going to say 10 wow. or more. I have a large number of series. Okay. All right. Do so you do the free, but go down the freebie route at all? Do you have free books? I always no. have one yep. first in series free book and only one with an asterisk of right this moment um, because at this moment I have two because one hasn't been turned off. Mm -hmm. um, but I always have one going and only one because I don't want um, to give too many books away. Mm -hmm. um, it's always a first in series and I always alter rotate it when they go stale, which which could be anywhere from six to nine months or so, depending. Um, and then I switch it to a different series. The reason why I alternate is because, as I mentioned, I have some that are historical and some are contemporary. Um, and um, not every reader wants or loves all of my series. So let's say um, I have a reader who's not interested in historical. They're never gonna buy my historical books. It's just not for them and that's okay. Um, but if I put a first in series free in my historic, one of my historical series, I'm not going to hit everyone with that. But if I turn that one off and switch it to a contemporary one, I might grab a different reader because they're eager to find my contemporary stories. Mm -hmm. So I rotate around, I alternate it because I don't have the expectation that every single reader will love every single one of my series. Mm. So how do you let them know that you've that you switched it up or <clears throat> excuse me, that you have a new oh, a free book up? If you're not advertising, because you, you're going to send it to your newsletter, obviously, you're probably going to put it on your Facebook page or social media pages that you do have. Right. Do you advertise in any other way or is it just through newsletter swaps? Right. That's a great question. Now, I, but I'm going to, on the end there, you add newsletter swaps. So I mm -hmm. don't do newsletter swaps. Right. No, I mean, like, I actually don't do them. You're all like looking uh, funny because like if Mary asked me, if Mary personally asked me to do a swap and I felt her book was a good fit for mine, I would do one. Mm -hmm. I'm a white author. So I 99% of the time do not do any kind of newsletter swaps with Kindle Unlimited books mm -hmm. um, because it, a swap means that there is a value to each person. Mm -hmm. And to me, um, sharing my Kindle Unlimited book with my mailing list is a value to that author, but in return, it's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kindle Unlimited readers um, are freebie seekers. They've already paid their money, their monthly fee, and they want their books for air quotes free in that they've already paid for their subscription. Mm -hmm. So they're probably, they may, there's some that may, but most of them will not buy my book. So, um, I don't do that. Um, I do do round robins and things like that, that where there is a swap, but if, but that swap is, um, in a controlled environment where I have chosen, the other authors when I'm part of a select group. So I am using them as much as they're using me for mm -hmm. my readership and I'm using them for theirs. So I want to make that really clear because mm -hmm. I think there's a big um, thing right now about ho-hum newsletter swaps as the only free option. But I'm gonna go back to your <laughs> original question mm -hmm. about how do I promote my free book? Um, I do share it with my newsletter. I do post it on social media. Um, and the one thing that I do that does cost money for a free book is I try to get a BookBub feature mm -hmm. deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and because um, they are great for wide books, they have a wide readership in their mailing list and it goes in front of, depending on your category, up to uh, up and an over a million people. Mm -hmm. So while they are expensive, um, they are actually remarkably cheap. So I'm pulling out my calculator and I'm going to say that the erotic romance list, I know it has over a million emails, but I'm just going to say a million and, um, and I'm going to divide it by the $792. It cost me, I did it backwards. I have to do 792 divided by a million. Sorry. I told you there should be no math. <laughs> that is 0. 0.00030 
seven, three, seven, nine. So it's 0. 0.0008 cents per email. Mm. So if you think about it that way, yeah, it's not that expensive. Mm. Obviously not all million plus people are going to open the email or select your book. And you know how many do select it because it's a free mm. book and you can find out on all of your retailers. Um, how, and then you can follow the read through from there on the sales of the other books in the series, which is what we all want. Yes. But if you think about it, we can never guarantee um, how much those ads cost. So like a Facebook ad or something, it's yeah. like 12 cents, 20 cents, 15, seven cents, whatever it is, a click. Well, this is 0. 0.00008, three zeros and an eight. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that is the one thing I do spend money on for a, yeah. my brand new perma-free title, if I can mm -hmm. get one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's the big thing, isn't it? If yeah. <laughs> Do you get them quite often? Is it something that happens regularly, would you say? Getting one? Mm -hmm. I have been successful in them. Um, I do try to submit to more as many categories as my book would fit in as possible. So if my book fits in, they love to put me in erotic romance, which is accurate, and I'm content with those readers. But if it also works in contemporary romance or um, um, even dark a romance, which isn't a great, because my books are not dark, but they're not as erotic as erotic either. So, and, you know, there's a couple categories my books could fit into. And so I want to make sure I try for all of them. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's mm. cool. Yeah, um, there go. And, and so, how many books would you have in a series? I and mean, Because you've got so many series, but you've also got a lot of books. Right? So are we averaging out about eight books a series, something like that? Oh, no. So my shortest one is two. Because mm -hmm. those books um, I loved and I wanted to write, but they weren't as well received with my mm -hmm. readers. So I stopped it too, mm -hmm. because I just I was like, oh, we're just going to move on because yeah. they weren't cutting it financially. Even though I enjoyed the stories, I had to walk away from it for um, financial strategy standpoint. I needed to move yeah. on to something that was going to be a better fit for my readers. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, qu I have quite a number that have three books. I have several that have four. I think I have one or two that have five one or two that have six and then I do have one that has 11 or 12. Right. And presumably that's the best selling like the series that does the best because you keep going in it or? That's a great question. That was my oldest series. That's the Bridgewater historical series. Mm -hmm. And so it was my oldest. So back in the day um, in 2015, when I wrote those, they were successful and I kept writing them because they were continuing to be well received. Mm -hmm. I did stop them because I got more tired of them than my readers yeah. and needed mm -hmm. to say something <laughs> different. However, I did go back a couple of years later and write three more to that series because I felt like going back and it was, yeah. it was still well-received. Mm -hmm. However, I do do track my math on my books to know what series are successful based off of actual income. Mm -hmm. And the second book in that series is my number one best-selling book. One, because wow. it's the oldest, right? Because it was written in 2015. So it's had eight years of of um, time Sounds. to accrue. Mm -hmm. But um, it um, was, well, probably it's eight years. And also because it's the beginning of a long series. Mm. It's possible some readers love to read through long series because they love that world. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So can I just touch on your release strategy a little bit? Sort of, sure. uh, do you... How soon out do you start promoting it? And what do you do for your release? Um, do you rapid release? Do you write a few and then release them? Or what, what's your, your strategy? I definitely don't do that because I'm a pantser. <laughs> so I have no idea okay. what my books are doing as I'm writing them. Mm. Um, and so I can't um, do several at once because or have a pile of them because um, I just can't have that many stories in my head. Mm. Um, I publish uh, the, this year about every two months. And so um, what I do plan is when I'm starting a new series is I'm planning that world. I always plan for three books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I commit, commit personally in my head to three books, except for that one I did too, because that one didn't do well at all. Mm -hmm. And so that one had to be shut down. But I commit to three books. Mm -hmm. And then if it does well, it's well received and I'm inspired by the series, I will write more. My mm -hmm. goal would be to write six books. So I have three and three. Yeah. Um, however, if it peters out, I will stop shorter. Um, so that's part of my strategy. So then um, I know that I'm doing at least three books. Um, 
I usually try to write to tropes or themes that are hot right now. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm a big reader. I read lots and lots of books, of romance books specifically. And so I am um, gobbling up different genres in romance and what's hot right now. Now, an example would be, I might read an MC or a motorcycle club book. I might read a vampire book. I might read a sci-fi book. I might read a cowboy book, right? All within like a week. They're all completely different. You can't really compare a vampire and a cowboy or a sci-fi that much. But the one thing that's the same in all of those books, as an example, is a secret baby. Mm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I just gave an example there. So mm -hmm. I just read five different subgenres of romance, but I noticed a theme that all of them had a secret baby in them. Mm -hmm. So what am I recognizing that might be really hot right now? Mm, secret baby. baby. Mm. And so um, I write small town, steamy small town, or I write, put the hat back on, write cowboy. Um, but I'm writing contemporary small town these days. And so what I'm probably going to write for book one would be a contemporary small town, secret baby. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to keep reading and reading. So if my time frame is two months to write and publish, so then in two months from now, I'm going to be reading and I'll be reading all those genres. And I'm going to notice that um, hockey players are really hot right now. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the hero's cousin is a hockey player from Phoenix, whatever. And <laughs> um, and he's come to town and, oh, he's a hockey player. So I add that in. And then the next one in four months from now, I'm going to read up and find something else that is seems to be consistently hot um mm -hmm. and then I'll write to that uh, but I'll wow. write it under the purview of my mm. um bread and butter mm. category subcategory turf okay. so you're really of, you're heavy on tropes you you write very heavy tropes you know what trope you're going to write and that's part of your marketing obviously I do because let's say I so if you asked me Vanessa, you just finished your book, which I did yesterday. I finished my book. Yay. Yay. I finished, you finished your book and you sent it to the editor. Can you give us a one sentence description of what that book's about? Uh, what are you going, what am I going to tell you about it? I'm going to tell you the tropes. Yeah. It is a small, steamy, small town, contemporary romance about a doctor um, who I have, to, I have to think back because I'm just... Um, on the spot, you know, who falls hard for the local um, first grade teacher um, who's mistaken for her twin with, you know, I'm making something up now because yeah. I'm on the spot, but um, I need to I throw all yeah. those tropes in. Yeah. And so when I, at, when I talk to other authors about their book and I'm like, okay, well, what's your book about? Tell me what the three main tropes are or themes of your story. And if they can't say what they are, then I'm like, okay, stop right there. Let's figure out what they are because they may not yeah. have any. Yeah. yeah. If you're yeah. just contemporary yeah. small town yeah. steamy and that's it, mm. they're all going to be the same and so ho hum. But if you're like, oh, well, now it's got a firefighter in it and it's a mistaken identity book because the twin is mistaken for the other twin. Yeah. And then he's actually a single father. Done. You've got single dad, mistaken identity, and firefighter. Done. Great. And then, I, then you know, you can raise that toll booth thing and you can drive through and write that story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, oh, so working with your friends on, and if you're talking to them like, okay, well, tell me about your book. What are your three, four, five, whatever number of tropes or themes you got? And if they can't say them to you, yeah, dig in and figure it out until they are like, oh, I do do that, but I just don't realize it. That's mm. usually the chase, case. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, like, wait a second, then see, and then also do that with past books and like outline what they are. Yeah. And if they're yeah. the same in, if you've got a three book series and they're all the same, then our readers can be super excited because it's like, oh, that's book. Oh, this is the same thing as that book. This is the same thing yeah. as that book. Mm. You want to mix them up mm. so that people are like, oh, this one's got a firefighter. Or, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And you yes. might not love firefighters for whatever crazy, insane person you are, but you might not love them. <laughs> but for one book, it might be okay. Yeah. 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 Mm. And that's cool. And that's really good advice, actually, that yeah, whole, real good. what are those three tropes? Because mm. I think that sometimes the trap we fall into is we 
and, and I know I've done it. Like you write mm. the book and then you go. Because it's what oh, you love. Yeah. And then <laughs> but you can't not... actually break it down into those yeah. tropes. Like that's yeah. actually, so knowing them from the start and being able mm. to kind of use that. Um, right. Is awesome. And since I'm a pantser, <laughs> I have nothing else to cling on to. I'm literally putting my hands up like little cat claws to cling <laughs> on to because I have no story. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I've got a, a man in small town uh, that America in Montana that's hot and alpha. <laughs> yeah. that's all I've got I'm like yeah, okay I got nothing right. so I don't even know how to start writing the story yeah, so yeah, I yeah. have to as a pantser identify these themes or tropes up front be like oh okay so now I've got a firefighter secret baby single dad okay well let me that will help yeah. me mm -hmm. pants my way through this story too so yeah. for me I have to have it but I think I think if you can answer those before you start chapter one on your computer then it will help a lot because it'll give you something to um, make the readers excited about. Yeah. Um, it'll also make something for you to write your blurb about mm -hmm. and um, your promotions that you post in different places because people are gonna be like, ooh, a secret, you know, a, a mistaken identity twin. Ooh, that's yeah. gonna be so good. Yeah. Readers just love that. And if you look these days on social media of any kind, you will see graphics everywhere that have the book cover in the middle with these little arrows mm -hmm. and it points to age gap secret baby mistaken identity mm -hmm. those are all the things i'm talking about and they're pointing them out to readers on social media why because readers are now buying books based off of those themes mm -hmm. or tropes yeah readers always did i mean if, if, if i'm it assuming always did mm -hmm. there yeah. has been no yeah, change whatsoever prominent. what i just yeah. shared with you is not anything new or no. remarkable no. or or even like mm -hmm. you know i didn't invent anything i'm just stating um that planning it from the start and incorporating it in the start is a great way for you to know where you're going and to have the foundation a brick built yeah. to give to your yeah. readers so they're excited beforehand you don't even have to have the story written okay guys the story is beginning chapter one this is a secret baby firefighter mistaken identity mm -hmm. twin story yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you don't even have to have a blurb and they're like oh this is going to be good yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then you have to cross your fingers that it really is yeah. <laughs> yeah. so i'm not <laughs> sharing anything remotely, remotely remarkable but what i'm offering is a concept as an author to um, make your books alluring to readers, um, mm -hmm. give you something to write to, give you something to promote from at the beginning. It's all free to do, but you can build hype with that alone. Yeah, And it's free. It's completely free. And when you see those graphics with that book in the middle and then the arrows, that's a great graphic to share for free to hook people to those books. Because if they love an age gap book and it says age gap on there, I guarantee excuse me, or almost guarantee, they're going to jump right on to checking it out. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because you say, I'm not telling you anything new, but I feel like mm. the layering that you're talking about is actually something I've never heard anyone talk about before. It's like the, here's my overarching, you know, small town contemporary um, sort of sexy romance with men who fall hard say that's your overarching and then you have the tropes under that and it's like every book has the biggest stuff but it's just going to be this the next level down right. tropes that are and what so, individualizes the books and that's intriguing way exactly. to think about and what's hilarious amusing and enjoyable to about what you just said is that you did it this way in my class I have a whole section on this where it is in reverse it is like a uh, um, wedding cake or starts. a cake and so if you think of a multi-tiered cake you're mm. setting the base layer as your category of contemporary. Mm. For me, I would be contemporary. And the next layer is your heat level because you don't want to mix up your heat level. You want it to be pretty consistent or not yeah. not pretty consistent, completely consistent. You don't want to put a, you know, out there erotica book and then in a sweet inspirational Hallmark movie type book on the next one because readers are going to be like, what the heck happened? Yeah. You want to find the you know, the heat level on your barometer, stick with that. And then on the next layer of the cake, maybe you add, for me, I would maybe add small town or cowboy, or it could be vampires. It could be paranormal. It could be whatever. And then on top of that, all the frosting and the yummy stuff that we just, all the readers just love yeah. is the themes and tropes. Uh, and so awesome. a whole section of my class is devoted to this topic. Yeah. Yeah. 
and that makes a lot of sense to me for it to be building up. I don't know why I went down, but no, but I think because it's you that had, foundation. You had just an upside down, you had pineapple upside yeah, down. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's a southern hemisphere thing. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. we're upside, <laughs> down, upside down. down. I'm sure you guys yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. we're yeah. hanging onto the bottom of the world. Yeah. The, yeah, good yeah, stuff, yeah. the good stuff is at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <it's> <laughs> <down>. <laughs> I, I think you can agree, though, that everyone, if you get a cupcake, what does everyone love? Yeah, frosting. it's always the same. The yeah. frosting, right? Yeah. You I mean the kids especially, but like, I mean, everybody, you want like that tower yeah. of frosting on mm-hmm. top. Nobody cares about the cake. No. It, but, but you it need the cake. Strong, you need the cake. Yeah. To hold up the frosting. Nobody's going to have a little cupcake with a just cake the frosting in it. You need the cake. <laughs> or icing, as we call it down here. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Icing, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it tastes yeah. good, whatever it's called. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's interesting. So so you're building in the marketing to actually into your product. So, yeah. so you've got the writing, you've got the tropes, you've you've written the book. So let's talk now about covers and and blurbs. Um and uh, uh, do you, uh, again is that just built in now because you've got those tropes, you just write this blurb that says secret baby, mistaken identity, buy it now, or is there something what do you think? I think that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to give my whole course away, but no, I'm just no, sharing no, the whole no, section no. of it. But yeah. yes, we had just mentioned that um, if I said to any one of you, it's like, what, what book are you working on right now? Mm-hmm. And so I can put any one of you on the spot. So Cheryl, what book are you writing right now? And what are the tropes or themes? <laughs> I'm writing a paranormal cozy mystery with a baker who's a witch okay so those are so you have workplace romance uh there is actually (laughs) technically and paranormal and so you could add so um so those are great options to have in there and so you can use all of the words you just had in your blurb because why Mm -hmm. you shared those specifically because of the most important to you and to your story and you want to include those in your blurb now i'm not saying that's your entire blurb but mm-hmm. you could say, you could say something like, Mary is a cake baker and she has amazing skills she didn't know she had until she started mixing in these ingredients together. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, she's a paranormal witch. You know what I mean? So I have no idea what I'm talking about. Fair warning. I'm sure her story is <laughs> nothing like what I just said. <laughs> but using those keywords that you just mentioned um, can, can be a basis for your blurb because mm-hmm. your readers will be hooked on those words. Mm. Yeah, yeah, mm. and and I think too, um, when you're getting to that stage too of of even before you're writing the book, is looking around what's out there, current and doing well in that genre, and um, and you pick up the keywords that can go into your blur, but actually can help you write the story. Like mm. for for me, um, it's it's a midlife, um, witch with a snarky cat familiar, right? You know, and those are those are actually individual words that appeared. And other people's titles or mm. or tropes or um sorry um blue yeah so, right but yeah. but you merge them in together into a great yeah. sentence that yes. is catchy and alluring to mm. to me and now I'm eager to read it because one I'm hungry <laughs> I love icing and frosting and having a a witch or paranormal elements mm. just makes and and I love cozy mysteries so mm. combining all of that just makes it endearing and mm. alluring to me. And especially with baked goods. I mean, especially if you talked about baked goods in your story. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're done. You got it. <laughs> I just want to share a quick story that's along the lines of, um, so I was doing research on Vanessa this morning and last night um, in preparation for our interview. And I looked up a book and I found one called Manhunt, Small Town Romance. And, um, and I bought it based on the blurb because I was like, this is awesome. And, um, and I, like based on what you're just telling you, you've got billionaire boss in there, and you've mm. and I and I love the fact that you kind of um it's funny, so clearly there's a bit of humor in your books, and then it's also you're telling this little bit of a story because you, so she accidentally emails her um, answers to a sex quiz to her billionaire box boss. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes and yes, I'm yes, like, yes, yes, yes. who is not going to buy this book? Honestly, yeah. like <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> Right. And I just, thank you for thank you for the promo on that. Under this thread that we were just talking about, I just pulled up my blurb for that. And I'm not going to read the blurb, but I'm going to scan through it and I'm going to say aloud the themes or tropes or um, 
alluring hooks that are in there. So billionaire boss, as you mentioned, um, I say that she's a genius. Um, she sneaks into the office, which means that it's a workplace romance. Um, he's older, fiercely mm -hmm. protective, and the possessive street decides Montana. So we know that he's older. He's alpha and protective, and it's it happens in Montana. Um, and I have to put my glasses on, which is sad. Um, and then we go into steamy small town romance, which is literally written there. Nerdy heroine and a lumberjack size billionaire. He's not just a billionaire, but he's lumberjack size. Yeah. So um, yeah, lumberjack is, is amazingly um, um, evocative, right? Like yes. you don't think of it. There's who just one, one word, word? <laughs> but it's a very specifically chosen word, right? Mm. Like that's right. Because I he actually is very very large. Like that's a problem for him, where he's just quite enormous and so um for me it was not a problem but um i wanted to ensure that he came across as large and lumberjack size because it takes place in montana would be a good term to use to reference lumberjack and people love lumberjack romance in general yeah. so if you were trying to hook a lumberjack reader then um that would do it so yes i have to if i'm going to talk the talk i have to walk the walk right yeah that's awesome yeah. and i think no, that's good can I just ask one more thing about this book, Shah? And then I'll yeah, go for it. <laughs> the other thing I note with this book is it's actually got a the the cover intrigues me because it is not the normal um, man chest kind of cover. It's a right. very um, so. Can you talk a little bit about it and just like where the where it came from and why you you're going along that line with those covers? Right, as I mentioned, I took the cowboy hat off of my heroes, and so I'm aiming more for small town romance. Uh, and because of that, when you take off the, when you have a cowboy hat on, readers often want the hot cowboy on the cover. And it's great, but small town romance, they don't always want the hot um, hero on the cover. Oftentimes, it's a clinch cover of couples. Sometimes it's um, neither. Um, I don't have any clinch cover. Well, I took the back. I don't have any clinch covers of a male and female, just one, you know, one of each on a cover. I do have male, female, male, intentionally because I want a reader to look at that cover and know it's a menage book. That was the point behind those clinch covers. But on um, just one male and one female stories, um, I always have one hot hero on the cover. So I chose not to do that on this new series because it's truly small town romance. And if when I did my research and looked at what's selling in small town romance now, it is not hot man chests mm -hmm. as much as others. Secondly, I wanted to try to hit um, readers on social media platforms like TikTok, et cetera, who are currently like, currently as of speaking these words um craving not manchester covers mm -hmm. okay that's so i tried that's... it yeah. and i and actually my last three series this one the co-written stories with helen hart um and the series last one with renee rose none of them have manchester on the covers so i was trying to get away from manchester one because i'm running out of them <laughs> um and um two because i'm trying to become um, a trying to reach a different audience who um, focuses less on the Manchester and more on um, image covers. Yeah, and is it working? Like have you those that series? It is. It has been well received. Also, um, I think this first book in this series, which is Manhunt, that you referenced. Um, I I want if you're familiar with Sixteen Candles, the movie mm -hmm. um, back in the eighties. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to write it using the premise of um, the heroine by ac accidentally dropping a sex quiz in the hands of the hero. And so um, if you're familiar with 16 Candles, it was back in the 80s and it, it was during study hall and she drops a piece of paper over her shoulder. So it was very 80s um, like, and we can't really do that these days. Um, and also I wanted to take it out of high school and into grown-up land mm -hmm. and so I had it where she accidentally emailed it to her billionaire boss so there's actually quite a bit of threads of 16 candles in the story if you love 16 candles mm -hmm. then you'll recognize them if you aren't familiar mm -hmm. with 16 candles at all it doesn't make a bit of difference yeah mm -hmm. love that. I love that movie back in the day I love that movie Jake <laughs> Ryan is my 
my first boyfriend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, Sha, did you have a question? I was just like, a question um, when you started. So I discovered you through the Bridgewater series, and um, I'm not a massive historical reader, but I absolutely love those books. Uh, I'm just curious what made you decide to stay with historical and contemporary on the same pen? Was that a conscious choice or purely practical? <laughs> um, because because um, since, as we mentioned on our conversation about the cake thing and talking about the layers, right? Mm. Since my um, main category was cowboy, my readers were okay jumping from mm. contemporary, historical to contemporary right. because I was still there their hopefully their author they love to write mm. wrote cowboys if i was known as the historical author it would be harder for me to yeah. leap to contemporary but it was a cowboy theme and so they were right. able to transition well gotcha. separately i did a strategic shift by moving my readers intentionally from historical to cowboy by taking the bridgewater county sorry bridgewater historical series mm. and then writing a modern day version of it in the yeah. same area of montana so mm. the, the historical ones founded the community founded the concept of a menage lifestyle and then i made a series called bridgewater county which was contemporary so it's the descendants of that town and of those people who were continuing on in modern times with that same concept of a menage lifestyle. So I was able to take those readers who love the historical and bring them into contemporary because it was the same world yeah. just 130 mm. some years later. It was like gently warming the water towards something Correct. new rather than taking them so from. I brought <laughs> yeah. them with yeah. me into the contemporary. Yeah. Did, did you, did and they... I kept everything the same because it was menage to menage. The only difference is 130 years and electricity. Yeah. <laughs> So a lot of the move came along, like it was quite a smooth transition, or did you lose some, oh, no, gain it came others? Along great. It was well received because mm -hmm. um, it, they loved the concept of that world in a different mm -hmm. way. I think yeah. me as a reader, I would gobble that up too, yeah. um, because I want to keep yeah. going. Kind of like um, Yellowstone, they took my idea. Yellowstone <laughs> in reverse. Mm -hmm. They went back in time. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And they went to what, 1885 and I think the 1920s. I have not seen any of the shows, but they intentionally went back in time because they needed a spinoff mm. in reverse. Yeah. And the readers love, or what the viewers loved the characters. And going back in time, they can see where the people they remembered in the future came from. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 People they do like that. Me. Epilogues, mm. prologues. Do you think you could do the same with, say, contemporary and paranormal, though? Because I feel like there's a different readership for paranormal, maybe, than right. So that's it. You you have like an excellent segue. So mm -hmm. I did that with the Wolf Ranch series, mm -hmm. where I made not just um, contemporary cowboys, I made them shifter cowboys with Renee Rose, and so um, I the story behind this is that I here in Colorado, I drove past randomly a subdivision called Wolf Ranch. And it was like a light bulb went off in my head. And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. this, this has to be done. And I connected with Rainy Rose because she writes paranormal. Yeah. And I said, I would love to write this series with you because you are known as the paranormal author and I'm known as the cowboy author. My readership isn't going to jump into paranormal that well by just me, because I'm not known for paranormal and, and vice versa. And so combining us together, mm -hmm. my readers were content with the books because I wrote the Cowboys and she was included in the paranormal and vice versa. When in fact, they read the stories and loved them hopefully as they were. And they, so it gave me buy-in for now being a shifter mm -hmm. author and for her, she could probably write some cowboys because her readers got buy-in that she was credible enough to do cowboys. So it yeah. works. Um, so if you can think of creative ways to slide in um, something else um, like that, then yes. Yeah. If you can <laughs> nudge your readers over or coax them, then absolutely. Yeah. That's good. Gosh, you're smart. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> the way that you've done, like, both the connecting the series and connecting that together is just really smart. Now, I, right. And so the things I'm suggesting, the only things I've mentioned today in this talk, 
that cost money was saying I was going to do a book bug feature deal for a perma free title, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Everything else I've talked about is conceptual and doesn't cost a penny, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's strategic in that um, I'm luring readers where I want them to go. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm choosing where I'm going before I go. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes um, because I want to make sure it's, I don't want to look back. I hate like, oh, I could have done it that way. That's, you know, everything we all agree, that's so frustrating. Even going to the grocery store or something, you forget your grocery bags and you're like, oh, I forgot them. You know, <laughs> it's it's it happens all the time in life. And so when we're working in business and you're trying to um, be efficient and swift as possible, mm -hmm. being strategic from the start and changing mm -hmm. your concepts and your thoughts about how you write mm -hmm. is free. But I always say it could also be very, very costly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which actually leads me on to the Thrifty Tips for Authors course. So at what stage would an author, should an author be, or would be the ideal author stage, or could it be a mix of somebody that's got quite a big backlist versus maybe somebody that's literally just starting out? Um, yes, it could be anyone from a new author to an established one. Established authors will have a backlist that they'll be able to work with on certain portions of the class that I talk about writing to your backlist and using the backlist to grow your income. Obviously mm -hmm. new readers who don't have um, a large um, library of published books um, will read that and be able to use that going forward. Mm -hmm. um, however, newer authors with less books will have possible less rework or tweaking to do if mm -hmm. there are changes to be made and they can make changes with the concepts that they learn going forward. Yeah. New authors are probably gonna be like, you know, whack in their head thinking like, oh, I could have, if I thought about this three books ago. Um, and mm -hmm. so um, <laughs> it's, it depends on where you are um, or it doesn't matter really where you are. Yeah. You get a different perspective out of it. Mm -hmm. um, the nice feature of the class is I include a private Facebook group just for class attendees so that you can work and meet mm -hmm. other authors who are learning the same materials as you so that when we're, when they're talking with each other about this cake concept I mentioned. They know what they're talking about. There's a base level of understanding on what they're coming from. So when they could say, hey, what are your three tropes or themes for your book? They'll be able to pull them out because they understand what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And also, as I mentioned, for those introverts of us who struggle to make new friends and new connections, this is a great environment to do so. Mm -hmm. And so those networking things were like, hey, I'm going to do a little group get together about promoting our books in this way. Do you want to join? Then there's a small safe group of people that you can meet and grow from there. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. So I think I feel like we're coming towards the end of the interview, but I just have one more question. And that is if someone's um, starting out or someone's going, um, I need more thrifty tips in my life. That <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's one piece of advice that you just want to leave our listeners with? Like, what would you tell them if they were just needed a bit of help? For very new authors, just keep writing books, you know, um, just read, read, read read what you're read the genres and the categories that you want to write to mm -hmm. and um and see what's happening in those those genres if it turns out that um you're reading them and don't like it you probably aren't going to like writing it mm -hmm. so you need to want to really enjoy what you're writing yeah. um so um read 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 um that's definitely one of them um the other would be um to Take the time to think about what you are writing and want to write and use it strategically about what is happening right now and um, and aim toward what readers are gobbling up in the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to add to that, making sure that I'm not saying if you're a contemporary cowboy author that you start writing sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, remember that secret baby I talked about? Yeah. That yeah. would be an example yeah that's great, it great that's, that's the thing to remember is it layers I like that yeah that's awesome thank you so much for coming on and joining us today it's been really awesome I've been thank you for fascinated yeah. fascinated by your answers um so you've obviously got the course coming up and it's got the early bird 
pricing until the 7th of April 2023. If you're listening to that after this, um, after that date, then unfortunately you've missed the early bird. But hopefully um, people who gobble up the interviews um, straight away, they will still get an opportunity to sign up. Um, so where can they find Thrifty Tips for Authors I, course? Yeah. I admit it's super easy. You can go to thriftytipsforauthors.com. Brilliant. Perfect. Perfect. And if and someone else wants to read something by Vanessa Vale, where can they find you? Um, VanessaValeAuthor.com. You and these URLs, you just I know. Some... Well, that's part of the class. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> and if you would, and if anyone listening would like to join the Facebook group, it you can just do a search on Facebook for Thrifty Tips for Authors. Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much. And where can we be found, Shah? And we can be found at spargirlspodcast.com. We are on Patreon. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate that at patreon.com forward slash spargirlspodcast. Awesome. Brilliant. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Spa Girls Podcast. We've had a great time here with Vanessa. Thank you so much. Um, and that is the end of the interview for another week. But we'll be back again next week, same time, same place. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Vanessa. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.